Bangladesh has sentenced two of its top religious leaders to death in a courtroom that is pregnant with accusations of political interference. Members of the country's Jamaat-e-Islami party are being tried for alleged war crimes committed during the 1971 liberation struggle. The Economist newspaper revealed a series of emails and telephone conversations between the presiding judge at the trial and a Bangladeshi lawyer based in Belgium. It pointed to evidence that allies of the country's ruling party were directly attempting to influence court proceedings. It led human rights campaigners to cry foul and thousands of Bangladeshis are now demanding a retrial. But thousands of them aren't. Instead, they're calling for the death penalty even before some of the cases have been heard. The Shahbag protesters, named after the area in Taka which they've occupied, want the suspects to be hanged. In our special report tonight, Bangladesh's main opposition party accuses the government of creating a fast trial to further its one-party agenda. They say the country is diving into a civil war, which will mean more bloodshed for a land that still bears the scars of its bloody liberation. It's been a political process from the very, very beginning. They're so stupid in their understanding of Islam is that they don't know what is the difference between Islam and Jamaat Islami. Mohyuddin Khan Alamgir is Bangladesh's Home Minister. On Saturday, he was awarded one of the country's top human rights accolades. For many of his countrymen, the decision beggars belief. He was East Pakistan's deputy commissioner during the entire period of the 1971 war. Some people would say that means he has blood on his hands. But he's not among the names of men being tried for committing war crimes. He's a member of the ruling Awami League party, which prompts critics to say he's being guarded from prosecution. The Awami League is led by Sheikh Hasina, the daughter of the man considered to have liberated Bangladesh in the 1970s. Mujibur Rahman's face appears on Bangladesh's currency. Countless colleges and institutions are named after him. And when the party took power in 2009, a lot of fuss went into the renaming of Dhaka's international airport in order to honour him. Mujibur Rahman promoted the idea of a Bangladesh based on secular democracy, but he banned other political parties and is said to have abolished all newspapers that he had no control over. His one-party state ended after he and members of his family were assassinated in 1975 by a group of army officers. It was a day his daughter, who now leads the party, will likely never forget. Sheikh Hasina took office in 2009 for a second time. It came after two years of an army-installed caretaker government, and during which time she and her BNP rival Khaled Azir were both imprisoned for corruption. Shortly after she was inaugurated, the country's border guard staged a mutiny in which 73 people, including over 50 of the country's top army officers, were killed. A secret recording of the meeting between the Prime Minister and the army later revealed that they blamed her for delaying the ending of the siege. Sheikh Hasina had negotiated the surrender, but army officers say she should have sent troops in immediately in order to crush the rebellion. Many in the army claimed the delay gave the border guards more time to kill the officers and rape their wives. A year later and Sheikh Hasina's party was again at the centre of political turmoil when the country's share market collapsed. It came after the central bank hiked interest rates and restricted money supply into the share markets over what it said were concerns of overvalued stocks. Awami League's members were accused of deliberately withdrawing investments from the market and thereby triggering panic among individual investors. A government inquiry into the affair concealed the names of anyone found to have committed wrong. Perhaps the most disturbing misconduct the government stands accused of is the forced disappearance of a number of opposition members. The main opposition party, which is the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, told us over 400 of its supporters have been kidnapped since Sheikh Hasina took office. None of them have been found. Today, the government of Bangladesh, led by Sheikh Hasina, faces more accusations. 
She's thought to have won the 2009 elections on the promise that she would try war criminals from the 1971 liberation struggle. It's a sensitive and highly provocative subject in Bangladesh, which says the war left three million of its people dead. But the special court set up to try the suspects has been mired by accusations of political interference, causing many to ask whether this is really about justice or whether it's about wiping out opponents to create that one-party state. Sultan Sharif is the president of the Awami League's UK wing. He joined his party at the age of just nine and passionately defends its decision to try the suspected war criminals this way. Mohyuddin Khan Alamgir, who was at the time served in the Pakistan government as deputy commissioner during the entire period of the 1971 war, will those people also be brought to account? If any, if anybody, any person against whom there is evidence of all these five sets of crimes or six sets of crimes, each and every one will be brought under trial, tried and under the due process of law. Why are you particularly going after jamaat e and all of your opponents and not looking within your own party? Uh, wrong. You are wrong. We are trying criminals, not jamaat islamis Some have alleged that this has become a political process, not so much a judicial one. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I would. Uh, it, it's been a political process from the very, very beginning. Now, the one thing that you have to understand is that war crimes trials generally are political by their very nature. It's generally the winner prosecuting the loser. That's uh, invariably what, what happens in a, in a war crimes trial. But there are, of course, those that are more politicized than others. And this is at the very top of the scale. Um, it's very clear that leading members of the government have played a very important role in this from the very, very beginning. The trouble with Toby Cadman's analysis of winners trying the losers is that the losers don't just end there. On the streets of Bangladesh over the last one month or so, nearly 150 people have lost their lives. Many of them innocent protesters who've taken to the streets to demonstrate against what they say are unfair trials. The International Criminal Court at The Hague doesn't hear retrospective cases, so the 1971 war doesn't fall under its jurisdiction. But Toby Cadman says the deaths on the streets can and should be investigated. But Bangladesh is a state party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and our position has always been that there are certain obligations that stem from that. The International Criminal Court has a uh, has a duty to ensure that its members adhere to proper standards. And that the situation is, as we have repeatedly informed the ICC, that these trials fall way below um, recognised um, standards. Who gave the order to use live ammunition on the protesters? Uh, I, I am surprised that a protester, when he goes and hacks a policeman, to death in front of camera if one of his colleagues uses his uh, rubber bullet or bullet to hurt that criminal, suddenly you have become sympathetic to that um, criminal who is acting at a time like killing a policeman. I'm talking about the civilian protesters. There are more of them. 83 of them have been killed. 83 people across Bangladesh have been killed. Who gave the order yeah. to use live ammunition? Uh, they gave the order when they started killing, who did? destroying. Now, those who were killed, they created a situation where they gave the order to the police to save hundreds and thousands of people, their properties, by doing what they did. If that, as a result, has created a situation where some people have life have, have been, uh, could not be spared. It is regrettable, but it is the job of the law enforcing authority to, to pr protect the law, to, shoot, to, to protect kill? the people. No killing, no killing is uh, permitted in law where it can be avoided. The protests and the subsequent killings on the streets of Bangladesh are unprecedented. The country has had a turbulent political history, 
and opposition parties say the latest clashes could lead to a civil war. Definitely Bangladesh is heading towards a civil war. The people of Bangladesh has not noticed and observed this kind of brutal killings by the police, police forces after the liberation war. In one day, the police had shot dead more than 70 people. In the last five days, 130 people have been killed by the police, including women as well. The idea of a civil war was suggested as early as last year, when Turkey's President Abdullah Gul wrote to his Bangladeshi counterpart, warning that a trial for Jamaat leaders could spark off a civil war. Civil war, if these sort of things continue, and if they do not control the police law enforcing agency, and if they don't listen to the opposition party, if they don't come to the right path and govern the country properly, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of democracy, for the sake of love of God, then there might be a continuation going towards the civil war. Yusuf Salim is a member of the Awami League in London. He is firm in his belief that Bangladeshis can contain the problem if both major parties work together. My sincere uh, wishes and hope, I want to see the forthcoming election in Bangladesh. Before that election, major part, political parties should agree in some basic points, democracy and nationalism, and, uh, and secularism. On that three basis, if we agree what our founder, uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, uh, sacrifices his life, uh, it is not very difficult if we think about our country's interest, uh, put our country's interest uh, before our own, then the major political parties like BNP and Aum can sit together today and sort out their differences and go for election and listen to the public verdict. Some will say this is a pipe dream. Certainly, it seems the BNP is suspicious of Awami League's motives. We are not safe in terms of when this political party came into power in 2009. Since then, they have been filing false cases against our leader, Begum Khaladajia, Tariq Rahman, our senior vice chair, by filing false cases, trying to suppress them, trying to oppress them, trying to neutralize them from the political field. And they have been doing it with a political motive. They don't have any tolerance level for their opposition. But unfortunately, uh, our party leaders have been disappeared, like Ilya Sali, former MP. A lot of people have been killed also. And um, we are not also safe. So it is a crackdown on opposition party totally, and we have to stand firm. Your government has been accused of trying to oppress any opposition of trying to wipe it out altogether. BNP members have, for example, been abducted and have disappeared. What has your government been doing about this? In 1975, on after 15th August, 70,000 of my young boys had to leave the country to save their lives. Today's political opposition are seen in the television every day, going around all over the country. And what are you talking about? You are talking about oppression. Oppression you have not seen. You haven't seen oppression by military rulers of 71. You haven't seen oppression by Zia and his cronies in, ba in Pakistan for long 16 years. Uh, we are victims of that. 